you be honest with me? What is it about me that is like, that you, m makes you not want to sit here? Honestly? Yeah. It's like everything, starting with your face first, just like the expression on it is really bad. You sort of look like you're smelling something that doesn't smell good or like you're like squinting even though you're wearing glasses, like your eyes don't work, you're effeminate but not in like a good way. It's almost insulting to women the way you're effeminate because like you're not androgynous. You're just like soft and doughy. You don't look like you have bones under your body at all. You're just sort of like an old baby, you know? You just seem very uncomfortable. You know, like a little bit, like you're apologizing for your existence. Just. Complete answer. TBTL. Here's a sentence I never thought I'd say, but if you thought a sausage couldn't really hurt anyone, frankly, think again. I was just trying to find E.T. E.T. Classic Spielberg. Oh. Weaver of dreams. I love when his finger lights up. That's how you can tell he's an alien. And his face. And his face. So, what are you working on these days? Eh, mostly I just sit around the house and complain about things. Yeah? How's that working out for you? Eh, I can't complain, so, you know. Is this a joke? Because if it is a joke, I just want to say that I get it. I get the joke, and I'm in on it also. And it's hilarious. All right, hello, good morning, and welcome, everyone, to a Wednesday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. Hey, where's the freaking gabagoo? My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. I don't know who that is, and I don't care to find out. Coming to you from the Madrona Hill studio, perched high above the mighty Columbia, where we're seeing some blue skies, folks. Oh, ma, pa, it's just beautiful. Some clouds, but a lot of blue sky, and we are entering into a run of four or five just absolutely spectacular early spring days. I've been which... waiting for this moment for months, and it's finally here. It is, it is noticeable inside me how different I feel knowing that we have good weather on the way and uh, that we're going to have, um, you know, sunny days and nice lawn mowing weekends and, and uh, everything's going to be okay, folks, because spring is here. It's springing and we've arrived at episode 4,161 in a collector series. Let the fun begin. I had um, a pretty memorable day, for me anyway, yesterday, uh, down in Los Angeles. I guess Culver City, to be specific. I guess the Sony studio lot uh, where they uh, tape episodes of Jeopardy, to be e extra specific. Never let me slip, because if I slip, then I'm slipping. It was a borderline religious experience. Walking around the stage there where they uh, film Jeopardy and watching... Uh, a number of uh, games being filmed. They they tape like five or six games in an afternoon, and I was watching those and got to try out the buzzer and write my name in the little thing. It was uh, it was pretty great. Is this real life? Um, the other way that I like to spend my time when I'm not watching Jeopardy is uh, cruising TikTok. Going to be a sit down comedian on Tiki Taki. But that might be difficult for me soon in these United States because. The U.S. House of Representatives just uh, passed a, um, basically a, a law, if you will, a measure uh, saying that TikTok either needs to sell to a non-Chinese company or face a ban in the United States. And I can't decide if a lack of access to TikTok would be a great thing for me or a not so great thing. So we will talk about that. Oh, and we'll talk to this guy, longest running Cobro of the show, maybe best known for his depictions. Of the tall ships, he is Andrew. Hold on. Walsh, and he's joining me right now. Good morning, my friend. Good morning, Luke. I have a um, I have a pitch for you, a, a good yep. old-fashioned TBTL segment pitch. Okay. And I could have run this by you off air, mm -hmm. but in case you don't like it, I want yeah. you to have to reject it. You want me it. to have as few options as possible. I, exactly, and if you do reject it, then I want you to reject it in front of a uh, a, a large jury of our peers, our yeah. listeners, okay? So I know that you and I uh, subscribe to some of the same like kind of morning newsletter emails. You know, they have kind of like a bunch of, a roundup of stories, and lots yeah. of times there's good content to talk about. I'm hoping you have not clicked on the one yet. 
um, that comes from Time Magazine. I don't get. Oh, is that in that's that's Time Magazine, but placed in an email from like Pocket? Yeah, or one I think of these this ones? is a Pocket. So, and I know okay. that you get Pocket as well. So, I'm asking you, as a friend and colleague, if we go mm-hmm. with this idea, maybe in tomorrow's show or later on yeah. in the week, that you don't click on this because I think it works better if you do not read this in advance. But Time Magazine has a post. It's an eight minute read. In case you're curious, how to respond to an insult according to therapists. And so what Andrew. I need from you, this is the most dangerous game, Luco. Andrew. Yeah. As the intro tape was playing, I was doing a thing that I tend to do, which is mindlessly scrolling oh, no. on my phone. You clicked on it. No, I didn't. Oh, good. Good. But I saw the headline as I was deleting. Let me go into my trash folder. Delete it. Burn it. Throw the phone away. Let's see. Uh, trash. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 9.47 a.m. from Pocket. How to respond to an insult, comma, according to Thera, dot, dot, dot. Yes. And I, as I was swiping left in my email program on my phone and hitting delete, I thought, actually, that would be a good TBTL topic. Am I going to remember to go back into my trash and rescue this and bring it up on the show? Because I, I can just speak for myself here. I don't take criticism very well. Um, and uh, in fact, was just complaining on the show the other day about somebody on the TBTL Facebook page saying something that slightly hurt my feelings. Anyway, I saw this headline, I thought that'd be a good topic, but um, uh, but I didn't actually like do the work to save this email, so thank you. No, I'm, and yes, we should talk about well, it. Well, it's more than we should talk about it. You haven't even heard my pitch yet, so that's, yeah. the, that's the headline. Listen, don't say less. Yeah, well, as here's the, kids the pitch. on the soon to be banned TikTok say, you've got me, man. And this is where it makes the segment both potentially amazing but also very dangerous. Oh no! For no, us, I, I have a, I have a hunch. I've read the comebacks. So basically, there is a list of sort of like comeback phrases suggested uh-huh. by Thera pists, according <laughs> to your uh, email preview. Um, actual. I'm not a therapist. I'm a Thera. <laughs> Comma. Pissed. Pissed. Yes. So anyway, what you need to do, and this is your homework assignment, is to come in tomorrow Mm -hmm. with about, I'm going to say, I think there's maybe seven or eight of these. You have to come in with like seven or eight insults that you're going to hurl my way. But you have to thread a needle here because I'm a sensitive boy. I'm a a thin-skinned boy. (laughs) They they, 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 They have to be specific enough that they're kind of funny but not so specific that they're hurtful. Exactly. So can you, I mean, if you like this idea, my pitch to you is Hmm. I don't read this article. I've got it in front of me. I've got the lists of comebacks and explanations. Well, it's a light, you know, it's a light week for me. (laughs) So um, I should definitely, uh, definitely let's try to come up with a segment where I have to do homework. Just, is it really that hard to come up with insults for me, Luke? I mean, trust me, I can put you in touch with some people I went to school with. Can they be, let me, no, I don't, are you kidding me? Is it that hard? You just, you've just framed why it's so hard to come up with insults for you. If I say to you, like, um, you know, your, your mom wears combat boots. Hey, 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 you know, you know what? I can come up with, I can come up with, I can come up with seven very, very general, like, kind of like, you know, odd dry up Mm -hmm. sort of. 1960s eras, uh, 1960s era like insults, but are those as interesting as if I try to come up with insults that are more Andrew specific, but then that, mm-hmm. but that are not so Andrew specific or so Andrew accurate that they are in fact slightly hurtful. You could come in with, is that your uh, face or did your neck throw up? Uh huh. That could be. Is a that good one. yeah? <laughs> then I would say this. No, don't do any is homework. Is that your face or is your neck blowing a bubble? <laughs> Ooh, oh, when I've never were, heard that one. That was we had that one when you were born. Uh, you know, the doctor uh, slapped your face. Save uh, it, Luke. Know, bottle it. Bottle it for the so segment. So they can be like they can be this level of insult. I think that's fine. Okay, I just well, then come up with something peasy. on the fly. I just like the idea of you, you know, insulting uh-huh. me however you choose yeah. to do that. And I will go into this with the thickest skin I can muster. I'll tell you what. I'll put the homework on myself. I will okay. thicken my skin tonight. I'll see if they have any um, skin There's a thickener. guy doing that on TikTok huh? that I, I'm always tempted to pull drops from him. But I don't know what his kind of full mental state is. So I want to mm-hmm. make sure his thing is... He is a guy who, and he doesn't have like millions of views, but his thing is he f- likes to fancy himself as the guy who can punch rocks. And 
uh, and like so he'll just put these videos up where he's and it's not even that's clear. one of the responses that therapists recommend by the way you insult hey, me and go I say punch rocks. go punch rocks he's like he'll, in his little preamble or his little boilerplate will go like hey hey I'm hey I'm Ronnie um, I'm the guy that punches rocks <laughs> currently in day 64 of putting horse medicine on my hands to try to make them tougher oh wow yeah, and that's the part that got me. Is this an is, ivermectin thing? Are there? I don't do, think do horses is. just have He's the best medicines. Some... <laughs> horses have the best medicines. There's something about the inside of a horse medicine that's good for the outside of a rock puncher's hand. He's he literally goes like, "I'm so and so, the guy who punches rocks. This is day 63 of me putting horse medicine on my hands <laughs> to try to make them tougher." And. It's just like there's so much to unpack from that statement. And I've so then, of course, I end up scrolling back into his video history to see, is he really like his thing is he, I can punch a rock until it basically turns into gravel or dust. Whoa. But I don't know if that's really what's happening. I mean, he doesn't punch it and he's not making the I don't think his his claim is you know, hand me a boulder, I'm going to punch it, and it's going to turn into dust. What he does is he'll just repetitively uh -huh. punch yeah, yeah. stuff yeah. until it kind of breaks down over time uh -huh. and then eventually gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Truthfully, it's not, even even his version of it, it's not super convincing. It's definitely something I wouldn't want to do and something that my these precious podcasters' mm -hmm. hands would not be able to do. So he does have some sort of physical ability that I don't have, but it's not quite, I think, as... I don't think it's quite as unique as maybe he's thinking it is, but it's the horse medicine part. Yeah. Or is it dog medicine? I got to find... I, I got to go mm. back and find this guy. Anyway, um, yeah, that's uh, that's one of the many reasons I hope that the United States um, Senate will... Please shoot down this bill vetoing TikTok because how else will I get my videos of guys punching rocks who are putting horse medicine on their hands so that their hands become tougher? We're going to talk about that later in the show, right? Like I, I won't, I won't get into that. We're going to talk but, about it right now. Yeah. It depends. Do you want me to go? Do you want me to wax rhapsodic about my experience at Jeopardy now or later? Well, we have time for both, so I guess we're here now. So I guess we can slide right into this. Um, yeah, I, I'm so. Slide I, right into TikTok. It's slide right into TikTok because you brought okay. it up, I guess. I'm yeah, not trying to sure. um we That's have fine. we have time to talk about it all today, I think. But uh I'm just weirdly confused about this story, and I feel like I'm general generally read into it. I'm not saying uh -huh. I took a deep dive on it. I've read, I don't know, what did you send me today? A Washington Post piece. I heard people talking about it on Morning Edition. Like I generally know this TikTok congressional story, but I just feel like there are such no nobody's explaining what they're truly worried about well in the press or maybe you've heard better than i have like i don't understand other than collecting our data and its ties to a foreign government a foreign government that the us is not traditionally friendly with i don't understand like what nobody's painted like the worst case scenario of what happens if we don't stop tiktok you know what that's a really good question and i don't know the answer to that and you're right it's not it's just being taken as a given that china having a bunch of personal data on Americans is something that they could then use against us in some way. But that what that would look like, I, I've never seen that described. It's just we don't want the communist Chinese government, the red Chinese. Yeah, they're starting to bring in the word communist. You're hearing the word communist more than ever yes. now, right? Yeah, it's it's back, baby. Yeah, like I, I you're right. I don't I don't uh, I think it's just taken as this kind of a gospel truth that uh, China wishes us ill, and if they have more of our information, um, our personal information and our behavioral patterns and all the things that they can analyze now because of how many of us are using TikTok, that somehow that just gives them a bunch of info that we don't want them to have. I guess, it's, yeah, I haven't, like, no one said they're going to build robots that look like us and they're going to, like, sneak them across the southern border and then, like, a, a Luke-esque robot is going to be operating in the U.S. and it'll be able to operate effectively because it knows that I've been looking at the the rock puncher. Like mm -hmm. what? Yeah. What? It, what are they actually going to do with the information um, if if things go as badly as as the people worried about it uh, are worried? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I, what I think is so interesting too is this clearly breaks down along the lines of people who do and do not give a shit about TikTok, i.e., as users of it. Like, sure. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like the people who it would be like, honestly, for me, it'd be like if they outlawed Facebook, I would not give a whit because I don't go on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, it's like the people like there's a, there's a, a, a pretty young, I think congressman, relatively new congressman. I'm thinking his name is Max Frost out of Florida. Who's, Ironic. <laughs> who's one of the, uh, I think he's, you know, he's, he's against this TikTok ban. And I believe the quote in the New York times was, uh, uh, I'm not just a no, I'm a hell no on this. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not a coincidence that I think he might be under the age of 30 and probably in the generation of people who use uh, TikTok a lot. It's also extra um, sort of confusing because the former president uh, of this country, who uh, we're obviously no fans of, is against the ban. Joe Biden is for this, well, basically for forcing ByteDance, the parent company, to sell to a non-Chinese mm -hmm. interest. So the, the, the White House is in favor of this thing that Congress is doing, which brings together the likes of Nancy Pelosi and like Chip Roy of Texas. And so, and then you've got like, uh, you know, the, the former president on the side of, of saying, well, let's not ban it. So I don't really, I, I do not want to be in league with him at all. But I do think that this really, to some degree, comes down to, are you a person who spends any time at all going on TikTok, and does it feel like it adds any value to your life? And if, you, if the answer is yes, you're probably like, hey, let me continue to have access to this. And if you're somebody like Nancy Pelosi, who couldn't probably pick a TikTok out from a, you know, taco time, you don't care about it. And I'm not trying to be mean to, to old Nancy Pelosi, but it's just like, I think this really breaks down along generational lines in a lot of ways. And user lines, and maybe that's one of the reasons I'm having trouble wrapping my head around this is because I don't go on TikTok. Like, my life would not be significantly different. I mean, I guess we'd miss out on some intro tape that you would send me. I'm not, I don't have a strong feeling on this one way or the other. I'm generally confused, and I'm kind of glad you brought up the Trump angle because I'll tell you what, I had a line of, of thought on this that then I heard a quote from Trump, and I'm like, oh, God, am I am I being right. Trumpy? But like, first of all, Trump was one of the first politicians to raise the specter of a yes. TikTok ban when he was in office, you know, however many years ago. And yes. he's, you know, so you can't really look to him for some steady eddy analysis on this. Right. But oh, really? Like, yeah, right. Hold on. Let me get my chair. I need to be sitting down. <laughs> so so now he's saying, OK, you know, I'm against this this legislation. Yeah. Purely but, for whatever he sees as the political advantage right. of, that, but, of that standpoint. And, but then at the same point saying we should we should eliminate totally Facebook because he sees Facebook as, as right. you know, an obstacle to his goals or whatever and so he's just got you know whatever that's yes. dictatorship but um <laughs> for me let's bring it back to small d dictatorship with me <laughs> um i got least can you tell could you tell i got lost there in what i was saying for a second but before i heard those quotes i'm listening to the story morning edition or whatever i'm thinking about it and i'm thinking well we see this mass collection of U.S. user data as a bit of a threat. And I understand that when you're talking about geopolitical situations, that's different than just handing Facebook over all this information because they're here and supposedly there are checks and balances on what happens here in the United States as, as we are supposed to have oversight over businesses. But here's what I'm getting at. I'm like, I know that TikTok is, you know, a much wider used by young people and has more um, influence on culture these days than um, than Twitter or what is now called X. But mm -hmm. why in the world, and this is what I'm getting to, why in the world do I trust Elon Musk with everybody's information just because he's an American as opposed huh. to right. the Chinese government? And I think there's probably a good answer to that, but that's what my brain sort of keeps on bumping up against. Oh, our country and the and the billionaires who are in charge of all of our data in this country are so great that the true, the true risk is communist China. I mean, they all seem pretty freaking dangerous to me. Yeah, and I don't know if we can, uh, you know, necessarily trust the Chinese government at their word, but mm -hmm. they created something called Project Texas, Ooh. Uh, which is uh, their plan to take over the state of Texas, uh -huh. um, which I have mixed feelings about. No, uh -huh. it's 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 there. I believe it's it's sort of bite dances. Um, attempt to appease U.S. regulators and, and, and uh, uh, you know, U.S. lawmakers that are worried about this. Basically, what they're saying is we've been keeping all of the U.S. data in this other special place. We have firewalled it off. Mm -hmm. A lockbox. And, and we're putting it in a lockbox. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so you don't have to worry about this because, like, A, we don't have bad intentions. 
B, we're not the Chinese government, even though we operate out of China and everything in China is presumably under the <laughs> control, or at least they can be easily brought under the control of the Chinese government. But they're like, we're not the Chinese government. We have no bad intention with the data. We're also like, Putting your data in a lock lockbox, we're calling Operation Texas or something. Mm. So that's it's weird. The, that's the Operation Texas is the secured information. Huh? I believe so. I can double secure, check yeah. this, but I think that's their. Um, uh, I think that that is is. Let's see. TikTok has spent more than one billion dollars on an extensive plan known as Project Texas mm. that aims to handle sensitive U.S. user data separately from the rest of the company's operations. That plan has been under review by a panel known as the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIS, named for Bo Cephas, Hank Williams Jr. Um, <laughs> no, but that would be great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the and slogan for Project Texas is don't trade on memes. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a show title. But um, so the, this this uh, this uh, organization or this agency in the United States that's supposed to be looking around, because, of course, the other thing is whether if it's not TikTok, it's um, my dad and I were talking about this this morning because uh, Walt is out here uh, helping me working on house stuff like just how many different things in our society, like American society, whether it's our cell phone towers or computers or cell phones or this, that, or the other, has a really strong kind of connection to China, is either made in China or the, you know, it's run by something that we are at this point very, very uh, reliant on, on, on things that are made in China or that China would have the ability to maybe stop the supply of mm -hmm. to us or turn them off remotely or whatever. That's why there was a whole thing about cell phone towers and and laws around should we continue to buy the parts literally from China because then we're kind of over a barrel. So there's a whole organization trying to look at everything and one of the things they're looking at is Project Texas and they're saying it doesn't actually solve the problem that we have of, of the Chinese government, of the red communist Chinese government. <laughs> I, um, uh, having all of our data. So it sounds like this isn't going to go very far in the Senate, though, right? Like, are, they don't even well, really have a Well, it's got bipartisan bill. support. I mean, the, like, look, the, 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 the way the Times wrote it up was it faces strong headwinds in the Senate, but then it also said those strong headwinds apparently are Chuck Schumer hasn't weighed in on it yet. It wasn't Chuck mm. Schumer saying absolutely no way. It just, and I mean, the fact that the president says he wants to sign it and that it passed like overwhelmingly in the house and again brought together the strangest of bedfellows mm -hmm. again i would say the organizing principle is people who don't give a shit about mm -hmm. tiktok um and uh or you know just don't use it day to day and uh and so i i don't know i mean the th i think the bigger challenge is in the courts probably because even if it's because again trump tried to do something like this and it got totally hung up in the courts very quickly on kind of like first amendment questions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i I, I think it's unlikely, at least according to like the three articles I read this morning. Um, uh, I, I think it's pretty unlikely that like I will be turning on my phone in four months and I won't be able to I won't be able to do my sweet, sweet scrolling mm -hmm. on TikTok. But it, it does raise this larger question. And, and again, you're pointing out something that's that's worth thinking about, which is like, what is the we're just taking it as a as a notion that it's somehow worse that the Chinese folks would have our information than Elon Musk having our information. And I, I would I guess I would like none of them to have my information. To, but also, I, I I can't be trusted with my thoughts mm -hmm. for any amount of time. And uh, I need to do my uh, I need to do my scrolling. And I will say this, too, on this show and even on the other shows that I work on, uh, particularly Livewire, that. What TikTok does what is it does connect me up with a a portion or an, an age cohort of the culture that I would otherwise be very disconnected from. Uh huh. Sure. And I, on the one hand, I feel kind of embarrassed about that because it's just like it's time for me, you know, to it's time for me to step to the side and to just completely stop knowing what um, Riz is. <laughs> Like there's no, I shouldn't know what Riz is. It's yes, not important. It's I not, think you I'm, should. I think it's good to know those things. I think it's important not to be the cringy older guy who then tries to embrace them and use them in his own life. And sure. you're not doing that. Sure, sure. That's I'll take that. I'll take that assessment. With one <laughs> exception of using dead ass one time that I believe you got smacked around on Twitter about. Remember that whole thing? 
<laughs> Did I didn't know that I got smacked around on Twitter. You brought that to me. That. that was a that was a topic on TBTL. I mean, forever ago, you used the word dead ass, and then some people jumped on that, just saying like you should not be using that. I'm trying I to believe. find you saying dead <laughs> that's ass, what, you're high. That's why you got that drop from that conversation. I'm like, I only know that phrase from <laughs> one Michael Christmas song where he says that, and then of course you weaponize that against me. The well, way China will weaponize TikTok yes. against the U.S. and U.S. citizens. So there it is, full circle. I do, I do think that for me, yeah, I do think that TikTok is actually a very valuable um, sort of uh, portal, if you will, into a bunch of actually a bunch of worlds that I just would not otherwise know about, have access to groups of people of, of sort of different interests, you know, people that are into whatever they might be into, different versions of life. Like, it, I guess that this could happen also on Facebook if you were the kind of person who was able to, I mean, the, the whole issue with Facebook, as I understand it, is it just starts delivering you massive amounts of only the kind of content and conversation that you've shown any interest in. So it has this way of sort of ossifying our beliefs and thoughts because instead of giving you a variety of things, it starts just giving you one kind of thing because that's the kind of thing you've hmm. you've liked. TikTok is weirdly not that way in my experience. Like it just goes through these life cycles. Like I'll just be getting, for a particular day, I'll just be getting, you know, a certain kind of corner of TikTok of people that are really into one kind of thing. And it's not, you know, I'm, I can't think of a great example off the top of my head, but it's quite varied by age, by race, by what, um, and, and you really see the different, the different, I guess you could say like subgroups and niches and you kind of pick up stuff from like, oh, you know, people in their twenties, uh, who are into skateboarding are using a certain kind of music in their videos or, you, you know, uh, people of color who are this age, um, are posting videos where they're maybe using this kind of writing on the screen and talking about it or, you know what I mean? Like it tends to get. It tend, there tend to be these patterns that emerge and it's views again into these different worlds that I would just never have in my normal life. And I do feel like that actually enriches my experience in a way that none of the other social media really does for me because, again, a lot of the other stuff tends to just deliver the stuff I'm already into. Like I cannot on Instagram, I cannot get away from expandable dining room table content now. Because one time I clicked on an ad because I was looking for a kind of a smallish dining room table for this little eat, eating area in my house. Like, I just get... That's I on feel Instagram, like, you're saying? You're getting those Instagram, Instagram ads. Instagram, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll give TikTok this. None of the ads are appealing to me. <laughs> like, yeah. like, it's weird. It's, it, and maybe it's because I don't ever post anything on Instagram. It only exists for me to view other people doing stuff. But I will say Instagram, the ads on Instagram have me completely figured out. To, to a degree that's frustrating because it drives my behaviors. I buy things all the time off of Instagram, um, or probably because I have some sort of a hole in my soul that I think will, I will fill with this thing. But they have figured out the kind of ads to hit me with for the kind of products that I'm likely to click through on. TikTok, it's none of that. TikTok is the worst advertising algorithm I've ever seen. It's never shown me anything I want to buy, which is also kind of weird, right? For a very successful company. Yeah. And, but to separate out here, the advertising, you got to, you got to um, the, to. the, um, you must keep them separated. <laughs> um, but to separate out here, the algorithm for the ads versus the actual content, I'm kind of surprised to hear you say to describe the user experience as far as taking in content in that way, because I like I've heard from listeners directly, like kind of just chatting on various public social media, probably Slack in this case, like talking about how their experience with TikTok could not be more different than your experience with TikTok, because it is literally like sort of fed to you in this way. And so we have a lot of listeners who are like, I remember there was a period when tick when you were new to TikTok and you were like feeling a little bit sheepish because they were feeding you a lot of like young people dancing in, uh -huh. in ways that were <laughs> slightly hornier than you were like completely comfortable sure. with given who you were. But like, you know, they it, it sort of came in that wave and other people were just like, that's so funny. I've never seen anything like that. I'm just getting nothing but plant content, you know, mm -hmm. because I like plants and now that's all I see is plant and knitting or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in a certain way, the, the, 
whole one of the selling points of TikTok is that it does find you where you are. And maybe your experience with seeing sort of various subcultures in this way speaks well to the way you use TikTok. Mm. But actually, generally speaking, doesn't it sort of seem that it is actually programmed more like you have less? That was my experience when I first logged on to TikTok. You can tell I'm young because I say I logged on to TikTok. The first time mm -hmm. I logged into TikTok, I found it very frustrating that I couldn't find, I couldn't seek out content that I wanted as well because it was more just like, hey, just don't worry about anything, Andrew. Just take the ride. I'm TikTok. I'll take you on a ride here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm just, what I'm doing as you're talking is I've actually opened up TikTok on my phone just to see what it's giving me. Um, and, uh, and just on today because like this here on this uh, Wednesday, because it, it really, for me, it does vary and it goes, it, it, it cycles through things. It'll be a lot of one, it'll be home improvement or home remodeling because I've been, I maybe part of what it is, if you subscribe, if you start following someone that's kind of over accounted for, mm. but like one of the things I'm very fascinated with is people cooking elaborate meals in jail. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. Prisine, huh? In Prisine, but on levels that we could have never known about back in the day when we talked Prisine. Because what we were talking about, low those many years ago when we were still a radio show was like, you know, things you could get out of the vending machine and then, I don't know, kind of more or less, I think combining ingredients out of the vending machine, but the cooking, the actual cooking that a lot of guys are doing, what happens is I get the sense that if you have a cell... I don't know if you have to be by yourself in there or not, but like if there's a surface, like maybe there's a, a kind of a little metal desk that's like built into the wall. It's like attached to the concrete wall. Mm -hmm. If you decide you're not going to use it as a desk, well, that's a metal cooktop. And what guys will do is they will basically like over time kind of scrape all the paint off mm -hmm. to where it's just metal again. They will make these like um, kind of sterno things with toilet paper that they wrap elaborately and put a wick in and they make these basically these like <clears throat> little heating devices that if you light enough of them underneath the metal you've created a huge griddle top mm -hmm. and like the the food that gets cooked is just fascinating to me uh, it looks terrible i feel like i want to i want to i want to comment and go i would leave the hot cheetos out of that mm. uh sandwich sir it looks it like looked pretty good up to a point and then you went too far. But anyway, uh, I get a lot like this is somebody I'm seeing somebody who's frying chicken. I don't know if you can actually see this. It's a guy who's frying chicken okay, in what yeah. looks like a waste basket yeah, using yeah. a stinger. So a stinger is basically like any kind of electrical cord that could have been for anything that has been cut and, and separated. So what it is basically is just electricity mm -hmm. and you drop it into water if you want to boil it you drop it into oil if you want to you cook plug it, so it into the wall and then you, you take plug the it raw the end and you drop the two yes. and, oh. and it's just applying electricity i.e heat mm -hmm. to whatever you're trying to do so i've got i've got that going then uh next up let's see uh this is an ad for uh some kind of walking treadmill okay um and then next up is i get a lot of this too it's just clips of stephen colbert okay yep and that's because I actually don't even follow this, but I let them play because I'm a big fan. Uh, next up, this is pretty funny. It's a clip of a guy that Camaro Kev and I are obsessed with named Don West. Don West used to hawk baseball cards on oh, like okay. QVC. Actually, I think it was the kind of uh, shopping channel you could get on on normal, like late at night on a Saturday, it would somehow come on like the regular TV station. And um, he would always yell, Jim Mint Tins, which was some particular kind of mint, uh, like uh, like really good condition, mm -hmm. like baseball card or whatever. Let's see. Uh, and then just like a very ex a, a real estate listing for a very expensive house in Los Angeles. And, is that um, an ad or is that content? No. Well, it's... It's somebody who is a real estate agent in in Southern California who mm -hmm. is kind of doing a real estate ad, but it's not yeah. sponsored yeah, content. Gotcha. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, a lot of this now happening, which is a woman in her car talking about either something bad that an ex did to her or um, a horrible date she went on. Mm -hmm. That's really there's. A very, very, very popular series of videos from a woman right now that was called like "Who the Hell Did I Marry?" or something. Have you seen? Is this burbled up no. into even your awareness? Nope. 
a woman was married to a guy um, <sighs> for some amount of time and did not realize that he had made up everything about his life. He had lied about his employment. He had lied about his family. He was having pretend, apparently, according to her, pretend phone conversations every day with friends and family where there was no one on the other side of the call. And he would just walk around the house in these one-way conversations so as to establish this whole life that he really didn't have. I this did burble its way up. I didn't <laughs> I didn't see it, but like I've I've heard people talking about it on podcasts because there were like a few of them that kind of happened all at the same time. There was another one involving, I believe, a a, a man who had a twin brother and was sort of scamming his wife oh, as well. I didn't hear about in, that. In a certain way. Oh, yeah, that's, there were kind of a couple spicy. at the same time. Yeah, but I don't I don't know the details on that. Yeah, so so and you're saying that sort of spawned even more like kind of people to make this content of being like, well, check out my story. It's yes, it's there's it's a very big it's a very big part of the content now. Basically, it's and it's typically women talking about just like um, really terrible dates they've just been on. They're usually like sitting in their car or sitting in their in their house with a glass of wine, having just come back from a horrible mm -hmm. date or talking about the the lengths uh, that some ex of theirs uh, went to uh, to deceive them in some way or other. Um, and uh, anyway, this is not paid off very well, but I guess I was just trying to, I was trying to get an assessment of what this morning looks like for mm -hmm. me, because it does feel, I, again, I'll just, I'll say this last thing and then I'll stop, uh, because I'm boring even myself here. Oh, by the way, I also get a lot of like Rogan adjacent stuff, mm. not because I'm particularly fond of Joe Rogan, but because every once in a while I'll let something play because I find it interesting, whether it's like a Huberman lab clip. This guy, Andrew Huberman, now has a podcast that's really popular, and he, I think, kind of blew up from being a guest on Rogan. He's a Stanford, like, ophthalmologist or something. But I'll get a lot of this kind of, like, uh, a doctor of something sitting in a podcasting studio mm -hmm. explaining, you know, that really, like, you know, uh, we should all be eating more red meat and drinking whiskey or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's always, like, something that's kind of counterintuitive or slightly heterodox in the mm -hmm. health and wellness space. Um, anyway, all I'm trying to say is TikTok, for all of its faults and for the fact that I may be giving my, my most valuable virginal data, my special gift, I may be giving it over to the Chinese government, it has really, I think, in, enriched my life in a way that other social media has not over the years because it has allowed me to see into the experience of a bunch of people that oftentimes look really different from me. In fact, what I would say, the thing I'm least likely to watch on TikTok is a 45 year old white guy. Mm -hmm. Those hold like a video where a guy who looks like me is just talking to you about like, you know, I don't know, just kind of like, Hey, here's what I'm like. Here's what I don't like when I'm on a date with some, or whatever it is. It's, even though I mentioned the Rogan stuff, that's really not primarily what I'm looking at. Funnily enough, the thing I'm least interested on TikTok is stuff like me. What I'm most interested in is people that look nothing like me, people that are like talking about some experience that I have no frame of reference for. That's the stuff that's interesting. And I will be honest with you, that's unique because I don't tend to pick up magazines that are written by and about people who look different than me. And I don't tend to, there's a lot of the wider culture that I don't engage with because it's not part of my lived experience and it kind of feels like it's sort of a different scene. TikTok is not like that for me, oddly enough. I want to know what people who are way different than me are doing. Another interesting thing about this, I think specifically, I find this interesting, not so much about the platform, but about specifically your relationship with the platform, Luke, is I feel like with other, so, in, you know, just tell me if I'm wrong about this, but having known you um, for pretty well for a long time, I feel like a, the greater appeal for you on a platform, let's say specifically Twitter, was your engagement with it, the stuff yes. that you produced and then yes. the, the endorphin hits that you would get as you would see things either be successful or less successful through likes and engagement yeah. and all that. And um, since you say goodbye to Twitter, well, whatever that was, two years ago now probably, um, and you've switched more of your, <laughs> your attention over to um, TikTok, you don't seem to have any, I mean, I have one TikTok, I think I made once because I just wanted to see how it worked. And it's basically me uh -huh. just staring at water or something like that. Um, but uh, I, have you even done that much on TikTok? I don't think you've created anything. I made one TikTok. Mm, were you staring and, at water? 
I wasn't staring at water. I feel like you had already accomplished everything <laughs> that there was to accomplish in that space. It's true. We need our own brands. The one TikTok that I made, if I go to my profile, uh, which, by the way, my profile photo is a picture of former Minnesota Vikings quarterback Kirk Cousins doing some kind of like neurofeedback program that he was it's just like a very funny mm -hmm. picture he's wearing looks like a bandana of neurofeedback little oh, electrodes because he was in the quarterback show when right. he was in that quarterback show yeah. but the one uh uh post that i have uh that i have put up because there was this again this trend where um typically you know kind of women of a certain age young women maybe in their you know 20s or early 30s would have a picture of them next to or nearby their significant other, their boyfriend or husband. And it would be the kind of thing where they're just taking a picture in the kitchen. He doesn't even know he's in the photo. And it would be kind of a, as they say, a flex. It would be this person saying, like, I snagged this dude and you didn't. And and therefore, I am, you know, I'm proud of myself over this. And this particular little photo uh, was from a, a woman said, I pulled him by hanging out with him one time. And it's a picture of her. She appears to be pregnant. And then this kind of like her dude in the background, he's just like in the kitchen doing something. She's like, I pulled him by hanging out with him one time, comma, you could never be me respectfully. And then I was so struck by the photo of her guy in the background and um, just what appeared to me to be um, his just his deep availability to really most people out there, if that makes any sense. And by the way, I'm not, this isn't kind about of Jamal people. Adams, the situation a little bit. I did in the direction <laughs> of this dude. I kind of yiked him a little bit. And, and, and what I will say is both of these people are conventionally fine looking. This isn't like yeah. me shaming somebody because of their body uh, type or, or their, you know, what I perceive to be their kind of neurotypicalness. Like, this, you know, she's a very conventionally attractive woman. He's a conventionally fine-looking guy. He just looks like a real derp. <laughs> and, like, you know, just your classic, like, he's got a couple zins. A couple zins in, you know, kind of just like, a, just looks like a normal derpy guy from somewhere in middle America. Nothing wrong with that. But the idea that that this was the flex that this that this particular um, uh, TikToker wanted to put out there. I just thought it was really funny. So my post, my one and only post, Andrew, is just a screenshot of her um, with that, with her saying her guy. And then if you scroll over, it's just a real close up picture on the dude. <laughs> That's it. No, I didn't write anything. It's just kind of like you I just guess used, you used the you were able to just sort of like kind of like repost that actual content. But you were able to zoom in on the guy's face like, yes, in, in post. Or exactly. Whatever. And I, um, this is my one and only post, which was literally, like you said, it was just to kind of try to learn the technology. It has 15 hearts. Mm. So it's getting out there. Sure. I think we can agree it's going viral. Nice. And that's Congrats. it. That's the one and only post I did. I'll probably delete it at some point. I haven't actually thought about it until this conversation. But you're right. My, oddly enough, uh, my relationship with, with TikTok is so radically different than my relationship with Twitter was because you're right. What I loved about Twitter, I mean, I did like reading things and I learned a lot on there and would see links to articles that were interesting and, and um, certainly illuminating. But mostly what it was was me getting a little bit drunk on an airplane and trying to think of a funny tweet, putting it out there and then getting pretty jazzed if some if, if a large number of people were interacting with the content or mm -hmm. if on a great day, Richard Marx said, this is a great tweet oh, that's as right. once happened. I don't even remember what the tweet was, but it, it was totally like performative on my part. It was totally about me being like, look at this thing, look at this observation that I had or this funny thing and, and, and getting a lot of good, like uh, getting a lot of good feelings off of a lot of dopamine off of the mm -hmm. responses. And that's completely different with this TikTok situation where I never post anything. It's not about people, not about me going like, hey, guess what? I have this great thought. It's totally me just kind of being a bit of an anthropologist through these worlds of all the different kinds of things that people are doing out there and ways that they talk, the kind of language that they use, the, again, the kind of music that they put under the stuff, the, the way the video is cut off in a certain way or the kind of backdrops that they use. Um, 
all of it is really interesting to me, but as a consumer of it, not as a performer of it. I mean, it, this is such a terrible way to end this segment. We should just end it there. That was a good wrap up. But now I'm going to do the TBTL thing and continue this ah. conversation and try to describe something very difficult to describe that if you haven't seen, this is going to be awful. But um, I follow again to, to reiterate the joke that everybody makes. Uh, I don't follow TikTok, but I see the important stuff when it migrates over to Instagram like a real yes. old right reels. Exactly. And I follow. Uh, Sarah Spain, who is uh -huh. or was with ESPN, um, and um, she shared something yesterday from TikTok, which is she said, this is the beauty of TikTok right here to see how the community kind of comes together around something cringy and makes it into something beautiful. And apparently you might even know this source material, although there's so much stuff out there. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't. But apparently there was some sort of like some sort of guy who seemed a little bit nerdy, but very self-confident. And apparently this video went viral for its cringiness because he's said says, hey, happy Star Wars Day, everybody. And also, this is the perfect time to introduce you to my new girlfriend. And he's like kind of he's got her in the frame, but he's sort of gripping her in this way that like really makes it seem like she is sort of just like an acquisition. She almost looks uh -huh. like a ventriloquist dummy. She looks a little bit uncomfortable and he's so excited to show off his girlfriend. And like literally, that's all I know of the original video. It's just like happy Star Wars to everybody. This is the perfect opportunity to show off my new girlfriend. And it seems sort of objectify -y. Um, or whatever, and just generally cringe. And so what happens is apparently one person takes his video and sort of expands it out a little bit so that they could add their own arm to it. They put on the same shirt he has on or something. <laughs> and you see that he's kind of like got, I, I don't know, maybe a, a toy pistol to her or something like he's holding her hostage. And yeah. then somebody else takes that and uh -huh. adds, expands it out. And you see that and they, they add their own wrists to it. And she you, she, you see yeah. that she's bound at the wrists. And it keeps going until eventually, like, you have somebody pretending like they're outside the door saying, this isn't cool. Let her go. Let her go. People are like flooding out of school buses with a bunch of toy guns like they're raiding the house to save her. Somebody then uh, cuts in a politician saying, my fellow Americans, we've heard the news of the hostage situation. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And again, as somebody who does not like spend any time on TikTok at all, this little argument for seeing how like you can sort of take something that was like cringy yeah. and turn it in just like, the hive mind and the creativity. Again, like yes. I get really, I know I've said this a lot. I don't know why I need to take it here but i just get so angry when i think about these youngish people um because i know everybody is making uh that's content, the end of the sentence right what's that you get so angry when you think about these youngish people <laughs> i get so people. angry when i think about these youngish people <laughs> that's what that's the andy rooney and me no yeah. i get really cranky when people are like i don't know man comedy's dead you can't say anything anymore whatever and again even like lebitard's a little bit like that and it drives me bananas because i'm like no no i i think if you look to tiktok which uh. clearly i don't do enough you see that there is brilliant there is oh so much funny, amazing brilliance. And there's so many more outlets for people to be funny legitimately. And there's tons of bad shit out there, too, that is cringy and you can pass over. But the good stuff kind of gets elevated. It's just not in the platforms that the old guys used to appreciate. And it's not necessarily Dave Chappelle standing on a stage talking yeah. into a microphone. Yeah. There are levels of comedy, particularly on TikTok, that are so visual that have to do with one kind of like like the you know like you just kind of described and like i've always really thought was cool about this this particular platform is the iterative process the way that a joke starts out one thing and then it just keeps i mean literally like you can throughout a day you can watch it evolve and mm -hmm. the there's a, a particular song that's being used as the as the kind of the soundtrack to whatever this particular meme or joke is and then someone re-records the song but in a kind of a different style mm -hmm. like maybe they do a folk version of it and but that they change some of the lyrics for some reason and then that becomes the new like the 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 layers of different jokes that get kind of layered on and the tags you might say to use an old comedy term and the iterative process of it is so unbelievably creative and funny to me and not something that you can easily like just take and like put on a stage somewhere and perform it as what we would call comedy or even make a TV show about it or even make a digital short about it. It's so hyper specific to to this medium. Yeah. And I guess you could can, you, you could say reels and TikTok are kind of the same thing. I, I think they're basically which by the way, this is why this is why Trump is against banning TikTok because my first thought was I was like, well if they ban TikTok, what will I do? I was like, well I'll probably just end up on reels because that's TikTok essentially and then every you know people will just start being on there but of course that's Facebook
Yeah, um, then it's with Zuckerberg and like again, right? Like, so it's kind of it's like I, but but um, but anyway, yeah. I all of that is to say I don't really know how I feel about this because something about saying it doesn't matter at all that we're all or at least those of us on TikTok are parting with. I'm sure all kinds of personal, like for instance, they know that I look essentially like Kirk Cousins doing a neurofeedback <laughs> drill. Right. <laughs> That's the Chinese. Xi Jinping has that on me now. If you are looking for something to augment your TBTL listening with, I cannot recommend the Sporkful highly enough. You know about this show, right? Produced by friend of the show and friend of me, Dan Pashman. They like to say that it is a show for eaters not for foodies. You don't have to know a lot about food. You just have to enjoy the experience of putting food in your mouth and chomping down on it and swallowing it. Um, <laughs> I'm very jealous of this other thing that Dan did a while ago. He invented a new kind of pasta. It's called cascatelli. I've bought it in the store and then made stuff with it. It's amazing. It's delicious. It's toothsome. It's all the things that Dan was trying to set out to do when he invented his own pasta. Uh, they talk about all kinds of interesting stuff on the Sporkful, like uh, why is the shallot super special? Is there such a thing as uh, halal pork? What kind of fast food should you eat on vacation? And stuff like that. Uh, we love Dan. You're going to love the Sporkful. Get it wherever you get your podcasts. We was hoping for some razzle-dazzle. Razzle-dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody razzle dazzle. Everybody razzle. Before you start talking here, Luke, I wow, need some you just positive really, feedback here. You really took advantage of the program that we're using where we can see each other. I you gave held, you the, the you I held, held a up a single finger, finger up, right into the camera. Big old finger up to the camera <laughs> so that I knew to that wouldn't have we you could not have used that uh that tool to stop me as of um uh, like three weeks ago. I wasn't even sure if you saw it. Sorry to step on you, but I wanted to know uh if you noticed the um back timed ring out on that sporkful promo that we just heard. It was and if nice. it gave you old school public radio production vibes. It was really good. A problem uh -huh. was my brain was distracted because of something that I said, because I tend to listen for my own performance. Oh, okay. Something I said at the end of that promo, which if I launch into this, it will First of all, I'll further embarrass myself and the program by trying to talk about tech and platforms and things. And also, oh, this will be a six-hour episode because we haven't even gotten to the Dazzling Donors yet. But I will just say this. Remind me to circle back on the topic of wherever you get your podcasts and how that is. Yeah. I believe the writer Anil Dash said, wherever you get your podcasts is a very powerful statement. Okay. About the media. Remind me to talk to you about that. Okay, that sounds good. Um, in the meantime, though, remind me to thank our first dazzling donor today. Of course, these are the uh, incredible, generous people who are supporting TBTL, keeping us going with a donation of dough that is truly dazzling. We're talking about Leslie Tunstall um, in St. Paul, Minnesota, one of my very Leslie. favorite places, one of my very favorite people. We've known exactly. Leslie for years. Leslie says, uh, too beautiful to live is a life preserver. It's a rescue ring, a lifeboat, a life jacket, an oxygen mask. It's a rescue dinghy, a guiding buoy, a lighthouse beacon, a torch in the stormy darkness. I'm not sure how this accolade somehow morphed into a maritime theme. Uh, Leslie writes, maybe it's because of that damn blue logo with Luke and Andrew sitting in a rowboat with oversized heads and puny hands and wrists and pointy knees. That's exactly why. <laughs> By the way... In the words they of Coolio, kept saying, like, in the art department at APM, they said, are the knees pointy enough? And we said, no, make them pointier. And make the heads bigger, please. Yes. Um, Leslie, uh, this is exactly why you're talking maritime terms when you're talking TBTL. Because, of course, if you look at that little boat we're in, it's the USS Friendship. Mm -hmm. The idea of this show being we're all about trying to cure global loneliness or at very least make friends with you all the listeners and help you become friends with each other so this is all part of a very intentional branding project and uh, exactly. it's worked well on leslie uh leslie says i love both hosts as much as any regular neurotic parasocial hmm. fan or groupie could i love luke for the story of running buck naked frantically throughout his half constructed bungalow searching madly for the missing bubbles who had managed to hide inside one of the bathroom walls i love andrew were you naked or is 
is that how Leslie likes to picture it? I mean, I don't, I don't know what goes on for Leslie. I may <laughs> have been, I certainly have, have, have. Again, I can't. I don't want to sidetrack us. We have this is an extensive message from Sorry, Leslie. Yes. No sidetracking. Yeah, that's that's my fault. Has Sorry, TV Chill considered getting an editor, Andrew? <laughs> I need one of those how to deal with insults tips right yeah. away. Stat. Can't wait for tomorrow's show. I need show. five CCs. Stat. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, uh, let's see. I love Andrew for having the soul of a saint no. to spend an entire evening driving aimlessly around Seattle, ferrying an unhoused, cognitively, co- cognitively compromised woman searching for her shelter until the lost lamb finally casually commented that maybe she might have the address in her cell phone. <laughs> now, I just said to you, let's not get distracted, but I do need to point out that my story was about nudity and irresponsible cat ownership, <laughs> and your story was about being Christ-like. Oh, that wasn't me. I just make those things up to sort of <laughs> feather my own reputational nest. Uh, I also love Andrew for not purchasing a new set of machetes with which to pursue the diabolical restaurateur who ruined one one memorable Thanksgiving dinner. That's my job. Call me the Danny Trejo of that story because I plan on someday really taking that guy down. I'm the one that's been tracking him across internet impressions more than you have, Andrew. Remember I found him in, in some other story and was like, this is our guy. We found him. He's in him. Nashville now, right? Causing trouble in Nashville or something yeah, like that? Yeah, just being seemingly kind of, I don't know, not the most pleasant person out there, mm-hmm. which, which to me was just rich considering how how kind of rude he was to you and Veeves and many other people who were merely looking forward to a Thanksgiving meal they had paid for. Exactly. Um, uh, Leslie says, um, uh, had I been in Andrew's shoes for either incident, Luke would have received a phone call to come downtown immediately and post bail for me for attempted <laughs> manslaughter. I'm trying this to think what that, what that bail would look like. Well, you don't have, you don't have any priors, right? Also, this is premeditated. It might, it might be worse than manslaughter. Yeah, it just I depends mean, on what, how the DA is feeling that day. But <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know, 150000 shored. Um, yeah, we could probably get that. We could probably mm-hmm. We need 15000 to get you out. Okay. okay, we've got it. I love Luke because he bursts out crying in public at the spectacle of an Indian immigrant father and his little daughter earnestly struggling to express himself in English at a deli counter in a supermarket. Uh, that is that is true. I be- I, 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 I I can't guess at the background of the person, but my guess would be just based on the local kind of um, sort of breakdown of folks. I'm thinking the person might have been from Central America, but the mm-hmm. but the overall point holds, which was a father and his daughter, father doing a money order, and having a difficult time communicating, um, and and the look on the face of the of the father, I was very um, it was relatable to me in a way because I I, I know what that feels like not to the degree that this guy might have been feeling it, because I've been very privileged in my life. But yes, I do. That particular topic, you get me talking about the Darien Gap, and I am, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to get get pretty emo. Um, I, uh, I, I love uh, Andrew for the way he makes his very funniest comments in a sort of throwaway, toss-off tone. Well, that's where mm. you're wrong, Leslie, because I listen back to the show sometimes. Mm. And what you have to realize is Andrew records the program at his place. So he does a thing where he lowers mm-hmm. the volume of my voice ever so slightly. I punch it in. And, and, and increases the volume of his voice, which is a mm-hmm. subtle kind of aural mm-hmm. cue of who is in control of the program. Mm-hmm. And, and then we'll go back in later and he'll record little bone mows and little asides. Yep, exactly. Um, I have a whole, I have actually a whole folder full of them. Yes. I've pre recorded thousands. Yeah. And so, I just punch him in. It's yeah. like the, um, the supplicant chicken. What was the Burger King? Subservient I was just talking, chicken. The subservient chicken. Exactly. I saw a supplicant chicken seems like subservient <laughs> the chicken. The succulent chicken sounds really good. A succulent Chinese <laughs> meal. I love when either one of them cracks each other up so much they have to step away from the microphone in order to soften the volume of their delighted laughter. I love that Luke is such a perfect exact embodiment of a seven on the engram scale that Ngram mm. authors no longer need to even write anything for their chapter chapter of Ngram 7. Uh, try just post a large photo of Luke on the page and move on to chapter 8. I um, I haven't... Uh, Ngram, the, uh, Ngram, that's not... Now, I, I want to be clear. I don't think... I think I might have been mispronouncing that because Ngram is a Scientology thing, but Ngram... Uh, is a different kind of it's like a Briggs Meyer type of thing, right? It's a sort of a mm-hmm. personality type, and and I guess I'm very very strongly a seven on that, according to Leslie. 
I didn't realize that engram and enagram. I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it right. Is it enagram? That's I'm the guessing thing that, that it's got to be said slightly different. It would so just be too close. confusing yeah. otherwise. But uh, the, the engrams, if I understand, is a is a Scientology term, and that's something you're trying to get over, trying to get rid of. When they have you do one of those mm-hmm. stress tests. Yes. Did med- you see the Super Bowl commercial for it? I don't know if it no. aired in all the markets. I think maybe somebody sent it to me in Genevieve. And you literally see it's about like the discovery centers that they have mm. around. And you go in. You're like, what is this? And they actually show people holding like whatever you call the soup can things. Uh-huh, or, like a couple you know. of like sort of electrodes that you, exactly. that you are supposed to be. Yeah. I don't By the think way, that's what Leslie is talking about. Enneagram type seven. I looked it up here. It says um, usually kind, kind of a home. Homely, mm-hmm. gassy. <laughs> it's weird that they got into that, isn't it? Are they using a photo of me? Because you've described me, I mean, perfectly with that. So thank you, Leslie. Uh, busy, variety seeking, spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I love that after 20 years together, Andrew still strives to not fart on Genevieve's in bed. <laughs> Speaking of gassy, yeah, that yeah. really turned on me there, didn't it? Uh, I love that too for you all. I'm a, I'm a supporter of preserving a little bit of the mystery in a relationship, but I would also say in true TBTL fashion, do whatever works for you in your life and in your relationship. I don't want to judge people that are just fart transplanting all over each other. Maybe that's your love language and I, I'm good... I'm good with that being your love language. I'm glad for you and Andrew, or you and Genevieve Andrew, and I'm glad for me and Becca that that's not, mm-hmm. that's not where our, that's not, that's not how our love language works. That's right. And I don't think you and I fart around each other either. Try not to. And you and I have, you know, we've been, we've, We've been trapped in a couple of fart lockers. Yeah. I mean, you hid a, a bottle of piss in a, I did. in a cupboard for me to discover one point. That was, That's that was fairly jackassy of me, I know. But, um, <laughs> anyway, Leslie, thank you for that incredibly yeah. nice, thoughtful, and thorough letter that you wrote after you'd already donated a significant amount of money to keep the show going. So thank you for all of that. We really appreciate it, and we really appreciate you. We love you, too. Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody rattle, rattle. We've also got to thank Katie O'Connell in Chicago, Illinois. Now, Katie writes in Luke's Irish accent as if I need to write that. Oh, as far as the pronunciation now, of Katie's Now, the thing is, though, I, here's the deal. I, even though, you know, my mom's uh, side of the family, the Kellys, hail from County Cork, I believe, strong Irish kind of uh, lineage for me. Um, I don't think of myself when I usually when I go off on a pronunciation from that part of the world, it's me trying to do my Scottish accent, which I have absolutely no family connection to or ability to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a lot of, uh, you know, when we thank our listener, Connor Mulcahy, right? I get real. I like I just think I watched a lot of The Simpsons, a lot of uh, school uh, schoolkeeper, Willie, uh, groundskeeper, groundskeeper, Willie. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. And um, uh, so, uh, but let me try because I used to have a um, I used to have a, a, a pastor, uh, I should say, a Bible teacher, named um, Trevor Harris, when I went to Jesus Creek, and and he was Irish, and he mm. would say, um, um, ha, oh, toy, toy, toy. There was a, and there was no. He would he would teach, and he would say, oh, there was a man called Billy uh, Billy Brown, and um, this was like kind of the vibe. I loved this mm. guy, by the way, Trevor Harris, like. He was the most fun teacher. He was just like, imagine a really charismatic, fun Irish dude that to just like turn loose on a bunch of students for like an hour, two days a week to just talk about the Bible. But without like, we didn't have to read the Bible. We didn't have to really like, Mm. it wasn't the boring side of all of this. It was just like a really fun kind of like, as Irish folks can tend to be, right? Mm -hmm. So let me try to get there with my Trevor, my pastor, Trevor Harris, Hi, um, Katie O'Connell of Chicago, Illinois. How was that? Did That's it go too good. far? Did it yeah, go? No. Did it go too far into someone has stolen my lucky charms? I was just waiting for Bill Clinton to pop out of that impression <laughs> somewhere, and so uh, I, I think that you were able to avoid that perfectly. Katie O'Connell says, "Long <laughs> live too beautiful to biz." Never stop sharing the absurd and mundane details of your and your cats' lives. Where would we be without you? Moi, moi. Is that the first? Is that the first kiss we've received from? Is that? Oh, is that what that is? Moi, moi. Oh, I believe. Yeah. Moi. That's oh, a kiss. I thought that was like Katie. A, Katie, we're taken. 
Yeah. I, I mean, we're busy. So fresh. Hey, Katie, we're busy not farting on other people. <laughs> Sorry, Katie. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for the donation, but... This is Luke me showing. Is, yeah, I'm trying to. So Luke is doing sort of a. I'm uh, doing the if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. Dance, oh, I see. To demonstrate see that, that I'm is. taking. But I actually am not married. I don't have a wedding ring on. So it kind of doesn't really. Uh-huh. It's not. It's not. First of all, that was. <laughs> I thought you were just having an episode, to be honest with you. For, I mean, the, the, the number of different ways in which that was unhelpful uh, <laughs> are pretty, pretty shocking. One, I just stopped talking. And this is <laughs> yeah. still. For now, anyway, an audio product. Yes. And then I started flashing my a ring to be like, I'm taken. But, of course, I'm not married. I don't wear a wedding ring. Mm-hmm. So that was like I was saying to Katie, like, come on over. Check it out. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm single. Oh, that's actually kind of a funny story about being on the, uh, <laughs> the Young Sheldon uh, set on Monday. Uh-huh. Young Sheldon. I was interviewing um, Jim Parsons and Mayim Bialik. And uh, because they were there, you know, obviously Jim Parsons was like the star of the Big Bang Theory. And then Mayim Bialik played his love interest. And I think they get married in the plot of the show. So they were in Los Angeles together to film some scenes for this other thing called Young Sheldon, because that's like the prequel. And I don't think I'm giving anything away, Um, but they they they're part of the final episode of this Young Sheldon show. I think it's kind of like. Sort of, you know, new heart when like he rolls over and realizes like he's in a snow globe or whatever. Mm-hmm. So the funny thing was we were just about to start rolling and my Bialik got up and said, oh, let me. She was still in costume from the show. Right. And she goes very funnily, by the way, very drolly. She goes, oh, I'm not married. I'm not a married person. She was like, and she was wearing a wedding ring because her character is a married mm-hmm. person. She goes, I need to take this off because I need to let people know this is on the market. <laughs> which was actually very funny she was very funny and likable as i've always Parsons. i've always liked her from afar yeah, yeah exactly in fact i i feel like in her like sort of i'm not a big big bang viewer but mm-hmm. um from what i've seen of it her like sort of nerdy character and style very much appeals to me sure that's I probably would have been your, crushing pretty hard yeah that's definitely your kind of you i mean that's that's in your in in your area, your zone of interest when it comes to yeah, the opposite My zone sex. of romantica. I yes. did. I, I will also say this: your zone of romantic. I will say that um, Chuck Lorre, the creator of that show, the creator of The Big Bang Theory. Well, he was co-creator of Young Sheldon, but he's a guy who you know, I he's done a lot of these like huge, hugely successful, hugely. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Valuable, like sitcoms, right? Like the guy is, the guy is 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 very 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 well positioned. Let's say from having created like a, a multiple long running and now syndicated shows. Like he's he's probably the most powerful. Top of the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 is is it all the TV? Is all of it TV that 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 I would like you know particularly sit down to watch? Not necessarily. It may not be for me, but you can't argue with the success of all of it. Like. And also just the, like, he is really, really, really the kind of guy who, who sets the tone for what sitcoms in America look like right now. And I'm talking to, um, like, I think I was talking to the actors, maybe it was when I was talking to Mayim Bialik and Jim Parsons, and one of them said, well, of course, Chuck Lorre. And I, and I knew Chuck Lorre was, like, sitting kind of behind me in a director's chair, just kind of hanging out on the set. We're like at the place where they film the TV show. And I go, Chuck Lorre, it's not ringing any bells. <laughs> Which I was, I think I was trying to be edgy because yeah. um, there were a lot of different people at this place. There were a lot of media entities. There was the CBS PR department was also shooting videos, the CBS social media. There was a lot of competition. And I think subconsciously I wanted to establish um, us as being different or me as being not like talk about bagel bites. If you know yes, what that means, right. Andrew. Yes, exactly. I wanted yeah, yeah. to be like, I'm the cool. From the other two. Yeah. I, yeah, I wanted to be like, I'm not just here to fawn on you. I'm here to be, I'm, I'm here, I'm a cool journalist from CBS Sunday Morning. Those are words that have never been said. Mm-hmm. I'm a cool journalist from CBS Sunday Morning. I'm, I'm not just here as part of a PR machinery to promote you. I'm here to get to the heart of what is it to be two of the actors featured in Young Sheldon. That was probably going through the back of my brain, which is why I decide to like basically go like, when they say Chuck Lorre and I go, never heard of him. 
So then, but because because I I, I try to be the the bad boy of 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 uh, of you know CBS Sunday Morning, but I'm also a little bit nervous about I don't know getting in trouble or because I was about to interview Chuck Lorre Chuck Lorre after this, and it was these two guys Steve Holland, Steve Malero, who's I consider a friend uh, who was a big TBTL listener for a long time, and then this guy Chuck Lorre, and Chuck Lorre is sitting back there, and I turn around to him after the interview and I say. By the way, I was I go I was joking when I said I didn't know who you are. I go I'm familiar with Chuck Lorre, and he just waits a beat and he goes, "Yeah, I'm familiar with jokes." <laughs> it was I mean he didn't say it, he he didn't say it in a way that was like trying to like um, he, he put you in your place. He wasn't trying to put me in my place, but it was a very good joke. Yeah, like, this is yeah. a person whose entire professional life has been creating shows that are full of jokes. And these well, well, but what, I think a huge part of that, though, is what did his face look like when he said it? Did he say it like kind of stone faced and very dry or was he kind of he was smirking at you, smiling? How did was, it feel? Uh, it, it felt funny to me. It felt like in okay. good. It felt like in good humor. Good, I, he yeah. wasn't. No, no. And, and then when we interviewed when I interviewed him, he was really nice. Like it. he wasn't trying to that as I perceived he wasn't trying to big dog me but mm -hmm. it was a perfectly delivered response yeah because of course he gets jokes I mean this is it's it's like saying like you know uh I don't know it's like it's like talking to a major league baseball pitcher and going like you know well I was trying to throw you a curveball and they're going yeah I'm familiar with curveballs mm -hmm. sure I spent right, a lot yeah. of time in my day thinking about curveballs but it was like it was perfectly delivered and um, I thought it was pretty funny. And I was nice. like, all right, well, this makes sense then. So You're the funny man. And Katie O'Connell is the supporter person, as is Leslie Tunstall. So thank you to our dazzling donors today. Here I go once again with the email. Every week I hope that it's from a female. Oh, man. It's not from a female. All right. Um, we've got to get to some uh, emails and emails, But I just wanted to say very quickly that... It was very, very cool to get to be on the set of Jeopardy yesterday. Like, I was, I was kind of not ready for how much I was going to be geeking out, uh, just to see the, you know, the board and to walk around on that stage and to watch the rehearsals um, and to just be kind of in that room uh, that I've, you know, a lot of what you hear about a lot of things like that, whether it's like Saturday Night Live or other, other. TV programs that there's a set, and then often when people go to the set, they're like, oh, I can't believe how small this is. Mm -hmm. It was the opposite for me. I thought it was very grand. I thought mm -hmm. it was actually more grand than I was expecting. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like... Because um, remember I told you, and I, I you asked me not to show it to you, so I don't think I did or used as a show photo, but like there was a photo circulating around of like the back of the big wheel on The Price is Right, <laughs> and how it's just like, you know, like some, some you know, press board or plywood or something right. with some like spray painting marks on the back of it, and you see just how like it seems so grand on the, yes. on the front of it, but it's like almost literally two-dimensional in that way. This did not have that effect not on Not at all. I mean, it was, it was, it was, I mean, it felt almost like, a, you know, sacred to me or something to be, to be in this room uh, where so much uh, television has been created over the years that I has, I, you know, I've taken such joy from. I will tell you a couple of things. One, I have now realized that I think I would do very badly on Jeopardy if I managed to get on. There was something about, I watched like maybe four games from the audience and because they tape a lot of games um, at one time. More than five, huh? I thought it might just be like one week. I think a typical is five. Typical okay. day is five. They were doing six when I was there because they've been, they were on this like extended break because of the writer's strike and because they had banked a bunch oh, of yeah, right. material uh, to try to still have new stuff to play during the strike. So they, um, uh, uh, they're they just coming back to, and this isn't going to, what I watched yesterday isn't going to air until April. But... There was something that there was a somehow a different level of concentration that I had sitting in the audience just watching where I think of myself as a pretty like a pretty good home Jeopardy player. By that, I mean, if you throw me into a room with kind of just like typical people like from my family or Becca and her family, although Becca is like a very really pretty dialed in on trivia and information. But like if you put me in a room with most sort of regular people and Jeopardy is on, I feel like I will probably know the answer maybe more than the average person, which has led me to, I think, the 
foolhardy belief that if I were to take the test for Jeopardy and then get through all the different, you know, vetting process and whatever, that maybe I could just get lucky and do okay on that show. Watching four shows in a row, just sitting there in the audience and realizing how many of the questions I had zero flipping mm-hmm. idea what the answer mm-hmm. was. It, it, I guess it's the difference of maybe like watching a football game on TV and kind of thinking like, I don't know, I could probably run a route. Mm-hmm. I mean, what you do, you, you take 10 steps with like your knees real high and then you fake this way and you go that way. Right. And then you maybe go to the game and you, you're down there on the field watching people. And you're like, no, 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 I could mm-hmm, not. Mm-hmm. I would die from this. This was sort of the equivalent of, of that for me, just watching how smart the contestants really are. And, but just the mechanics of the game were fascinating to me. Um, and I was, I was talking when we were interviewing Ken Jennings, but also I was just talking to him a little bit kind of when we weren't recording and he was like, so what do you think of this whole thing? And I was like, you know, I don't want to say that I'm not always thrilled about every story that I get to do for CBS Sunday morning because I am, I'm honored to have the job, but there are certainly times when I am maybe more amped up. And this was one of those days they couldn't get me. I was just sitting in the empty studio audience watching. So at the beginning of the day, they rehearsed the show with the contestants. So they have Jimmy, who used to be part of the Clue crew, who's now the stage manager um, for the show. He runs everyone through practice rounds of Jeopardy so that when you're standing up there doing it and you're, it's your first time on the show, you're not like completely and totally overwhelmed, mm-hmm. which is very smart, by the way, because mm-hmm. um, it is obviously super intimidating. Um, to use another uh, kind of analogy that is often used in sports, I think specifically football, like you just need the game to slow down a little bit because yeah. if you're up there and you have that adrenaline running through you, you just must feel so separated from your own body. Oh my gosh. I, Which I, I'm going to feel, uh, by the way, next Friday when I'm on KOW. <laughs> I don't know if we've talked about that on the show, but we've talked about it off air. I'm supposed to be on a show. And I'm, I am I came back from vacation. I, this has been on the books for a while. And then I came back from vacation. And I temporarily forgot about it. And now <laughs> just this morning, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm like a week away from being on that show. And I, I'm already like pitting out in my shirt. Oh, my gosh. I don't want to make be. it worse for you, but I'm fascinated by this. And I want to talk about it. Yeah, we should on talk the show about this it. week um, just to kind of like maybe try to help you kind of your stress go down and also just to mm-hmm. try to understand what's exactly going on with us. I was. I don't want to overstate it. I was a little bit out of my body just watching Jeopardy, Mm -hmm. just being in the room and, and kind of just watching it all go down. Again, it's something that I have watched most nights. Certainly if I am home, most nights of my life for the last 25 years, you know, since I had a home to go to that was my own and a cable television (laughs) subscription, most nights I will watch Jeopardy. I enjoy the show. And I, I can't think of much else that I've consumed that much of over the years to then be in the room where it's happening and just look around and be like, okay, well, that's what that is. And this, and then, of course, having the kind of cool opportunity because we were there doing the TV thing to actually go up and stand on the stage later when everybody was, you know, when the audience was gone and kind of check out the signaling buzzer and, and like write my name. And they just get to do all of that stuff. It was really, really fun. Like, it was one of those days. Did what, you get the sense of the, those bu- buzzers having the delay that everybody talks about? Well, yeah, because there is a, um, you know, uh, there's a person over on the kind of judge's table who is basically holding down a button that when Ken Jennings is done delivering the question, he then releases the button. Oh, that's why they don't work until until that person says they work. The so, buzzers don't work until that person says they work. That's true. And so yeah, when I that see. person, when he takes his finger off of this button, um, that's that's basically like kind of muting the whole situation. So it's kind of two things. It's like him listening to Ken Jennings finishing saying the question or or the 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 answer. Mm-hmm. Honestly, they should get rid of that whole thing. The like whole yeah, right. questions and answers and whatnot. So um, it's simple. It's put very a, confusing. Also, put a big wheel in there. That's with, all. Maybe a maybe a, an attractive gal turning the letters. <laughs> right. But um. So so there's kind of like these. There's these like human. There's this human component, which is like Ken Jennings gets done reading the question or reading the answer, or whatever the hell it is, and then this guy over at the table, he hears the end of the 
Ken Jennings part, and then he says, okay, now it's time to go. And you're, as the contestant, trying to kind of figure out this rhythm of all of this, because if you buzz in too early, you get locked out for like half a second, which oh, is... Oh, so you can't just go click, 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 waiting for him to undo it. No, you get, you're oh, getting locked, not for, you're not like, you're not like locked out for the entirety of it, but mm-hmm. you just, you know, a half a second in that game against yeah. all of those other smart people is enough time that, I mean, most of the questions, at least two of the contestants probably know the answer. So yeah. if you get locked, and it's really like most of them by like midway through the reading of it, they already know what they're, now they go into like buzzer, optimal buzzer mode, mm-hmm. basically, you know what I mean? So uh, anyway, I just games. was, I was just, I was just delighted to be there the whole time and was, yeah, just really enjoyed it. Everybody was super nice to us as well. And um, uh, yeah, it was just, it was great. If you, if you uh, are in, uh, I'm not getting paid to say this, but I'm telling you, if you're a Jeopardy fan, oh, the other thing that somebody who was sitting, I was sitting in the audience, and the very kindly couple sitting next to me said, oh, we're in from Tucson, and we love Jeopardy, and so we just went on the website, and we got these tickets. It was pretty easy, so I guess I would say, I would recommend it if you're ever visiting Los Angeles, and you like that show, see about getting tickets. I, you know, they got to like, you got to put a fair number of people through the through the uh, live audience every week you know they're kind of got to put butts in seats mm-hmm. so it was really fun and did you just laugh did you like pretend like you were on the stage of like uh, the sound stage of like a a sitcom and just like laugh inappropriately mm-hmm. after each i answer, did sort of a, like a, Rob, a bob de niro from cape fear i haven't seen it so uh, did you hide underneath a car We'll see, I, that's good, the only good, thing I know. Go. That's, that's the only that thing I know about that. Yeah, I believe famously, he like the family that he's menacing goes to see a movie, and there's somebody smoking a cigar. I want to say and laughing maniacally in the back of the oh, theater. Oh, okay. And yeah, the theater is largely empty, and he's just like, and and they don't know who it is, and of course it's it's Robert De Niro. Um, no, but you know what did happen was, I didn't get the speech that the, 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 the live, the real audience was all waiting outside the studio, you know, in a line. And I'm sure they got like a whole kind of spiel from the, from the production folks. And I'm sure a big part of it was turn off your cell phones, you know, like turn them off, off, like don't even put them on silent. You just turn them off. So they don't work because of course they're very concerned about photography and, and, and things like that. And, uh, and anyway, I didn't get any of that speech. I, cause I was buzzing around. We're filming Ken backstage, signing headshots and things. So I go and I sit down and the show is going. Questions are being asked. And oh, no. I, my phone starts no. ringing on my watch. So when my, you know, when I have my, my real cell phone with me and I'm wearing my Apple watch, if my phone starts ringing, my watch starts hapticking. Mm-hmm. And this is very. But it's only hap ticking. It's not making an actual ringing. It isn't, thankfully. But I Oof. couldn't tell you, Andrew, what setting I have it on. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. every time I like update my system, or I don't know, bump something. Like it could, it's 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 always it's always a new adventure with this stuff. Like is it set up on? Is my alarm? Because like the alarm that's on my phone. Like my just alarm all set for various things. Sometimes it'll just start going off on my watch as well as my phone and it'll be making an alarm sound on my, like there's just a million settings that I just don't give enough thought to. And all I could think as I looked down on my phone and saw that my, for some reason, my old management company of my old apartment in Portland was calling me. I think I might be getting mail there still or something. I just looked down and I just see gray star on my watch. Oh no. And I'm like, is this my watch getting the message almost before my phone does. And is my, my hand starts vibrating. My wrist starts vibrating. And I'm like, is this the, the, is this the half second before my phone in my pocket starts ringing? Because that would be a very possible scenario. Because again, these settings are always changing. I don't have good high phone hygiene with this stuff. And the fear that coursed through me in that nine tenths of a second, as I considered is my cell phone about to start ringing in my pocket in the middle of someone trying to answer a potent potable? I was freaking out. But it didn't ring. It did not As, ring. In the words of Lucille Bluth, that was a freebie. <laughs> like you just it got was, away with it. I did, but then I didn't want to take. I, so then I was like, I should take my phone out and turn it off. Like so, there's no way yeah. this can. But I was like, if they see me digging for my phone, are they going to come over and be like, 
you can't have your phone out. Like, is having my phone out of my pocket a worse mm-hmm. transgression than possibly having the ringer on my phone not off enough? I didn't mm-hmm. know. But there was also the element that I'm there with CBS Sunday morning. I thought the irony of if a game gets screwed up because the reporter from the other TV network uh, didn't turn their phone off, like, would just, that would be the poorest of poor form. If it's some retiree from Tucson, it's like, mistakes happen. If it's me, it's like, get your shit together, burbs. I did think it was interesting. I had to look up, I didn't remember which network Jeopardy is on, and that's NBC. And of ABC. course, you're doing a story. Oh, really? Oh, I just looked it up and it told me NBC. You know what? But that Here, must have been the thing. wrong. I think it's a non-denominational in that. Yeah, anybody I don't can think pick it up. Yeah. I, I say ABC because when I was growing up, yeah. it was on the ABC station in Seattle. But I think, it, I think it goes wherever it wants to go. That makes more sense. Yeah, and I don't know why. It, it popped up NBC here, but it, it looks like, yeah. I, I think you're right. I think it's like it can... Um, it can air wherever it wants to, depending on the local affiliates. But um, what I, I was going to say was I, it, there's interesting symmetry here in these two different stories because you have Maya Bialik, who you're talking to, mm. of course, until recently. Yes. was also one of the hosts on Jeopardy. Yeah. And, but you're in all in the same day. You're interviewing her about a totally non-Jeopardy story, whereas two yeah. years ago you probably would have been interviewing her yeah. about Jeopardy or whatever. But uh, literally two different networks. That's why I was looking that up earlier. And I was trying to be careful to not bring that up. I didn't know what exactly the deal was on everything. Yeah, that seemed like a strange thing, right? Wasn't her original thing like she's didn't she post something publicly like I just found out today that I'm no longer with Jeopardy or something? Wasn't that it wasn't I should some, considering that I'm working super... on a TV story this week about it, I should know more of the details and I will before this hits the air on Sunday. <laughs> um but like um yeah, I got the sense my sense of the thing is that as the dust eventually was starting to finally settle with this whole Jeopardy hosting thing, which we covered, you know, uh, by the way, I'm getting another, I'm getting another call on my watch. You can see what yeah, it looks as we like. speak. Yeah. But see, it's not, thankfully it's not ringing. It's just, uh, you know, it's just, it's not ringing. It's just, just vibrating. Overflowing. My sense of my sense of how the, how, how that kind of relationship ended was at some point, the people in charge of Jeopardy, after all of the like auditioning people and then hiring that one kind of sleazy guy and then firing him and then having co hosts, was God, wouldn't life be easier if we just had one host and it was Ken Jennings? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think that probably they kind of, you know, I think somewhere in their heart of hearts, they just wanted to have him be the host, probably because of his experience with the program. I think he's well liked by the viewers. He seems like a known quantity. And none of this is a, is a reflection on Mayim Bialik, who, by the way, again, when I met her in person was very very smart and very very poised and very likable like all the things you would kind of want in one of these hosts and i think by the way did a really good job when i watched mm-hmm. episode she hosted of jeopardy i honestly think the mike richards guy wasn't bad either i didn't mm. think anyone was bad at hosting jeopardy mm-hmm. that's the weird part other than future vice president aaron Rodgers. <laughs> how did we get 94 <laughs> minutes into the show before we've even talked about that shit but anyway it said rfk is eyeing two people one is aaron <laughs> rogers is the other one jesse joe the, rogan jesse the oh, body ventura, I right. jesse ventura. Uh, what i thought was was just spectacular was that i think i was on the set of jeopardy yesterday when i saw this coming on my phone this like breaking news that rfk jr said he's been in extensive talks with Aaron Rodgers, he's been in like they've just they've been in regular communication over this for some yeah. period of time. I don't know why probably in that... a steam bath under the desert <laughs> somewhere. Know. Like why that detail? Like it's first of all the whole thing is unhinged. Like right. it's just unhinged and it's silly and it's not going anywhere. But but it, I thought it was unhinged in the world of just kind of like I'm going to say something to get back in the news. I'm RFK Jr. Um. But the idea that they've been having sort of substantive talks, mm-hmm. <laughs> like what those talks must sound like, like yeah, the fact that they right. like have been in multiple phone conversations discussing the future of this country and their um, plan to uh, become president and vice president of this country, just two blithering idiots mm-hmm. just gassing each other up. I don't... So something about the fact that they've they're they're in conversation over this just cracked yeah. me up so hard. I passed a truck, and I hate how much this lives in my head, but I passed a little white pickup truck, clearly like kind of a work vehicle yesterday um, near the grocery store, and it was just I get just I get so triggered. I'm such a snowflake, but it was just like on the back 
window of the cab there was like a a, a bump a sticker that was the shape of washington mm. and it just said inside the state fuck inslee ah. with a big middle finger and then another another sticker next to it that says i will not comply and i was just like <laughs> I, I i literally gave the truck the middle finger but kind of at a time when i knew he wouldn't see me so that's how remember. i'm dealing that's how i'm dealing with things <laughs> the middle finger well <laughs> but, <laughs> you know what happens when they can see you as, as i learned they might follow oh, you right. all the way to Skamania Lodge and try to fight you. <laughs> and then unfold themselves out of their car. Do, like is there something thing. funny about this tiny car I'm driving? I'm glad you knew exactly. In fact, when we were talking about Cape Fear before, I was going to tell you, oh, I do oh, sort of know because of, of that the laughing SpongeBob. scene. Because of, not, not, uh, oh, not, no, not SpongeBob. SpongeBob. Um, it'd it be a really, Sideshow Bob. It'd be a really different episode if it was SpongeBob doing all that stuff. Honestly, I think most of what I know about Cape Fear was from yeah. the Cape Fear your parody episode of the simpsons which went into some great detail uh and that was probably in 1995 or six i i honestly that might be where i'm getting all of my cape fear knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i should watch it and also i mean and that was a remake right like that there was originally yeah a, yeah. yeah i what, think that was, was yeah that was a uh, that was a reboot um, okay. Hey, are you in the mood to hear a voicemail here? I've never been more in the mood to hear a voicemail. <laughs> okay. Um, this is from listener Rachel responding to some conversation we have that I literally do not remember um, about the Heimlich maneuver. This was on our voicemail line, but I think it was from maybe a month or so ago. So my apologies for playing it so late. But you don't need to remember our conversation about the Heimlich maneuver okay, good, to, I don't. Appreciate, yeah, to appreciate. I wonder if Rachel called the wrong podcast. Hey guys, it's listener Rachel from Pittsburgh. Um, I was just listening to you guys talking about doing the Heimlich maneuver and different emotions you have about it, and I have a story to tell on the matter. Um, the year was maybe 2010. Uh, I was driving. I was riding the back seat. I was in college, and I was riding the back seat of my friend's car. You know, smushed in between two of my other good friends. We're driving home from Pittsburgh, eating mm. snacks. And I start choking on one of the snacks. And next to me uh, is my one friend who's just, like, shocked. I start, like, you know, putting my hands on my throat because I literally cannot breathe. My one friend next to me, she's, like, shocked and, and doesn't do anything. And next to me is my other friend, Andrew, who is, like, my husband has described him as uh, a man that's uh, he's really got – uh, film noir PI vibes, which I think is exactly right. Like he's got a wry sense of humor, but he's he's pretty formal, and I really never see him let loose entirely, except for in this moment when he cheered, yes, as I was choking, hmm. and then hit me on the back a few times. He gave me some back blows from our weird, you know, angled seats and the back seat of someone's, you know, Ford Focus. <laughs> And um, and I did like spit out the particulate, hmm. and um, and I looked at him and I was like, yes. And he tried to explain that he was really excited because he had just learned in health class how to do this, <laughs> and he realized he had an opportunity to use this in real life. Um, but I was kind of dying, and I did not appreciate uh, his response. Um, Andrew is my TBTL baby, so. Um, he will be hearing this, and I expect, Andrew, if you have a different recollection of this, to uh, call it and tell the guys what you remember. Um, <laughs> Love it. Andrew, but, uh, the, Andrew the, private, the private investigator. Yeah, interesting. That, um, like, yeah, okay. I'm trying to think. Is there a moment in my life where I've been excited about something that is unfortunate because I can spring into action? I'm not the type of guy who really springs into action. I more fall back into action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I um, totally understand this other Andrew's feeling like I would – I don't want anyone to be in danger or to be afraid for their their life, but I would love – I would love to be in a busy restaurant um, when someone starts choking and be the only person who knows how to do the Heimlich maneuver. Not unlike, I believe, Bill Murray's character in Groundhog Day. I think that's one of that's one of the oh, things yeah. that starts happening when he's really dialing in his life in that day is he's constantly saving a guy who is choking on like a piece of something. And then he does it so casually by the end. And I believe right? he says something like, uh, you might want to try chewing that first. And then everyone laughs. Yeah. Like he's just perfecting the moment. 
Um, I would love to have that moment. I would love to be able, because the Heimlich seems pretty straightforward, pretty hard to mess up. You know, you make a fist and you place it over the stomach below kind of the, um, you know, where the rib cage is. You don't need to be up in the ribs um, or up in the, you know, um, what do you call that? The, uh, the xiphoid, chest. The oh. chest, the xiphoid process, I believe is part really? of that. Yeah, I only know that because when we used to have basketball practice, Mr. Collard, when you were, he really wanted you to learn how to take a charge on defense, which would be to kind of get yourself set and let the guy with the ball crash into you. And he'd be like, you want to have them hit you right in your xiphoid process. Oh, okay. Point being, you get the, you, you sort of make a fist, you reach around and you have the fist below all of that there, you know, um, and down in the stomach. And then you kind of, you sort of pull upwards. And it seems like it's kind of, whereas, you know, CPR, the thing about CPR is things have gone dangerously wrong at that point, presumably. If you're doing, if you're doing, uh, you know, rescue breathing or CPR yes. on someone, that's that's a level of seriousness. I don't want to be around. But mm-hmm. somebody with like some, a little bit of, um, you know, a, a, a piece of steak that they didn't chew enough, that I can kind of, whoop, and then it co- comedically flies out across the room, and then they have that relief. And then I'm the hero. That I can And then get everybody really lifts you up sort of on their shoulders yes. and music starts playing and, and they sort of parade people you around. Stomp on two wine glasses and suddenly mm-hmm. I'm Jewish married. You're married to the person that you just saved. It's yeah. complicated, but also I can a, a see tale the told a million times. I understand yeah. Andrew being like, Yes, I can use my skills here. Although he went with the hearty back slap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now Which one is... thing, by the way, you're supposed to do, I'm not making this up, but also don't Take my advice. Read up on this, please. This is not mm-hmm. a um, this is not a medical advice show or a um, you know I don't know what a CPR <laughs> advice show or anything. But I believe if you're talking about a very small child, like a, a you know maybe a, a toddler or a baby, if they're choking on something, something that they say you can do is literally pick them up by their by their ankles and mm-hmm. kind of do an upside down you know because they're small enough you can do that and that's really like going to reverse the the trajectory or reverse the 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 voyage of whatever is stuck in them. And there are so many you're videos always of doing always this. always shake a toddler. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that wasn't a regional thing, right? You guys had the billboards around here that said never 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 shake a baby. I I think I have seen them. I have definitely okay. I've definitely seen them. And and but we we are but I want to be clear, we're anti baby shaking on this show. We're anti baby shaking. We're pro shaking. baby saving as far as if they're choking on a piece of gristle. First of all, why are you giving your baby a steak? Yeah, stop giving your baby That's steak. weird. That's a weird parental behavior. I'm also pro slapping somebody a couple of times across the face yes, if they're just acting to hysterical. Help them get it together. But only if they're a <laughs> yes. woman. Yes. <laughs> but only if they're only like if crying. They're a hysterical exactly. woman. That's the best only if they're a woman that. having a thought about anything i've been watching too many black and white movies um all right anyway well thank you for that story rachel and yes. yeah andrew if you have another perspective on yeah that, i want to hear andrew's it. perspective it was a stormy night on i-15 <laughs> outside of pittsburgh <laughs> the dame started choking i um want to you know what i don't know if we do this enough or if it's obvious or not but the phone number is 206-414-8285 that's 206-414-tbtl please leave us a message andrew remind me tomorrow on the show this Andrew or the other Andrew? The other Andrew. Okay. Um, uh, this, no, I'm sorry. You, Andrew. Me, uh, Andrew. Remind okay. me tomorrow to tell you about something that I discovered about the show while you were gone, while I was in charge of more things on the show than normal. Okay. That explained a lot. So I got to remember that, and you got to insult me tomorrow. Don't forget. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I'm coming Believe loaded. Me. <laughs> I got a lot of. Oh wow! Oh look, the first smile I've seen all day <laughs> from Luke. <laughs> oh, I got. Oh, I got thoughts. I got thoughts. All right, thank you everyone for listening. Thanks for being part of TVTL. We are going to be back here tomorrow with more imaginary radio for you. So please to join us for that. In the meantime, have a great Wednesday. Take care of yourselves. Enjoy the uh, nicer weather if it's happening where you are. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. I don't really know how to end this conversation, so high five. Sure. Power out.